He came over uh, to somebody's house very unexpectedly. And when he came unexpectedly, he came into the house and he, there was a little girl that wanted to, he wanted to make a good impression on the people, but the little girl wanted to make a good impression on, on the pastor. So the pastor turned to the little girl and says, why don't you go and run and get that good book we all love and bring it in here to me. She was gone for just a minute or two and she runs back in and she hands it to the preacher. The preacher looked and he was a little startled at first. He was wondering why she brought that, but she had actually brought the Sears catalog. Uh, and there she was to offer the Sears. How many of y'all remember the Sears catalog? Remember the catalogs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sears is almost no more. Uh, but, yeah, those of you just told on your age, if you remember the catalog, Sears, J.C. Penney, and on and on. Well, you know, the biggest Thanksgiving killer that we have here in the United States um, is really the day after Thanksgiving when Christmas shopping begins and we stop thinking about what we're thankful for and we start thinking about what we want. Mm. Have you ever thought about that? Now many of us like to pursue the Christmas catalog. We look at all the neat stuff we want. Remember that as a kid, you kind of look through it and say, oh, that'd be cool, that'd be... My, my all-time thing, I never got it for Christmas. They talked me out of it somehow. But mine was uh, an R2-D2 remote robot thing. You know, you just, you get, they said, you don't really want that, do you? They kept trying to talk me out of it. I said, fine, no, I guess I don't want it. So that's all they had to hear before I didn't get it. So anyway... But that was my all-time favorite. Friends, we need to spend more time looking at the neat stuff we already have. Amen? And in Psalm 103, we find God's catalog of mercies, so to speak. And it's not a Christmas catalog. I really believe it's a Thanksgiving catalog that we can all look at and take, and, 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 and take in and, and really look at what we do have. See, there's, th there's six things that we can praise God for, but, um, but first I want to talk about this psalm itself. This, is, this psalm is really like David's hallelujah psalm. He, he, he leads his hallelujah chorus, so to speak. It contains 22 verses, which just happens to be the same number of letters that are in the Hebrew alphabet. As a matter of fact, the title Lord, or Jehovah, occurs just half that number of times. And it is what we, what we call an envelope psalm. Anybody ever heard that phrase, envelope psalm? Well, it's an envelope psalm. And what it means is, is that it, start, it starts and ends exactly the same way. The opening and closing words are, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Amen. And in the original text, the verses are all of uniform length, and they all contain two lines each. As a matter of fact, anytime we have trouble praising the Lord, we should turn to this psalm and get before the Lord and recite it back to Him. We should pray this psalm back to God as, as our thanks to Him and thanksgiving to Him. Amen? And you say, Brother Don, why should we do that? Listen, I'm not telling you what to do. Yeah, really I am. We ought to do that. Amen? We need to give God thanks. Well, let's dig into this a little bit and find the first item in, in God's Thanksgiving catalog. Amen? Number one, the first thing we find is the remission of sins. The remission of sin. In Psalm 103, verse 3, it says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. And the word iniquities is a very strong word. Friends, it does not mean mistake. You see, a lot of folks think sin is, oh, I just made a mistake. No, they're iniquities. And you know, if the, what if the Bible said Christ died for our mistakes? Anybody? There's one time I heard somebody talk. One time they said, they said that uh, their youngest child, well, that's our mistake. Anybody ever heard them talk about a kid that way? Oh, you just want to slap them, amen? It's not a mistake. But God forgives more than mistakes. He forgives our iniquities. All our ingrained perversity, He forgives. All the bentness of being, everything that causes us to be sinful, He forgives all of that. That's what we're talking about today. Oh, amen. Praise the Lord. Glory. Hallelujah. Friends, I'm going to have... I Listen, I'm just going to praise the Lord today. And you have two choices. One, you can come right along with the ride. Or number two, you can sit right there and put your little sourpuss face on and just endure the message. Amen? But we're going to have a praise and time for the Lord Jesus Christ today. Amen. Now, next, David 
sees the believer as a forgiven penitent. And he says, he forgiveth all our iniquities. Now, I want to talk about the measure of his forgiveness. The measure of his forgiveness. In, in, in verse 12 of Psalm 103, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Did anybody ever notice that that's a horizontal measure? Anybody ever notice that that's a horizontal line? What if he said, as far as the north is from the south? What if he said that? Would that be, would that be just as good? Yes or no? no? Why not? Well, the reason is, if you continue to go north, you're eventually going to get to what's called the North Pole. And if you go south far enough, you're eventually going to get to a place called the South Pole. But if you go east far enough, you'll end up west. And if you go west far enough, in other words, we can go east and west forever and ever and ever, and those two points will never touch. There will never be a point at which you will stop going east. Anybody ever notice that? You'll not stop it. As a matter of fact, we can start to travel and never, ever end up east until we end up west. Right? If you were to go around the globe, guess what? <laughs> you start here, but you're maybe you touch shore over in California somewhere, right? Well, now you're west. What happened to east? Well, it gave way to west, but there wasn't a point at which it stops. West is always west. East is always east. Micah 7, 19 says, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Woo! That's more than I meant to shout. Amen? <laughs> into the depths of the sea. So number one, remission of sin. Number two, the second item in God's catalog. You ready? Restoration of health. Restoration of health. And I'm not just talking about physical health. I'm talking about spiritual and mental health. Amen? One, uh, verse 3 says this, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. In a well-known poem, it was entitled The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Uh, Coleridge depicts the plight of some ancient voyagers whose ship had drifted off course. And there's a beautiful seabird. It was an albatross that accompany the ship, and it brings favorable winds. Well, that's a good omen. When that when it's flying by, it's a good omen. Brings good winds. Let the albatross fly with us. Well, some, some, some idiot, I'm sorry. Yeah, some idiot sailor shoots the bird with a crossbow. The winds die along with the albatross. So the dead bird was hung around the neck of the guilty sailor as a constant reminder of his foolish error. You know, Israel's much the same. Israel, too, could have hung a dead albatross around her neck as a reminder of her very frequent and very tragic mistakes. As a matter of fact, what albatross do you have around your neck today? I want you to turn to Psalm 106. Hold your finger at 103. Turn over to 106. And the first verse we're going to read there is verse 8. You ready? 106, verse 8. It says, Nevertheless, He saved them for His name's sake, that He might make His mighty power to be known. Now go down to verse 44 of the same one. Nevertheless, He regarded their affliction when He heard their cry. When we, under, when we go to verses 8 and 44, I want you to make a mental note of it right now, but in just a minute, I'm going to give you a piece of paper. I want you to understand the word nevertheless. Nevertheless, in each of the verses. So we could possibly make a statement like this. This is our statement. Even though I have blank, nevertheless, God has forgiven me. Nevertheless, I've had an immoral relationship. God has forgiven me. Even though I've done this or even though I've done that. Nevertheless, God has forgiven me. And you say, Brother Don, what's so important about that? The important thing is, is that so many things, if you'll just take one and pass them, thank you. 
Take one and pass them. Thank you. Take one and pass them. Thank you. Take one and pass them. Thank you. The interesting thing about this is, is so many times there are so many people, whether saved or unsaved, that would say, by the way, unsaved, your sins are, 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 are paid for. Uh, they are just not remitted to your account yet because you have not given them to Him for Him to wash, wash them away. But here's the thing, my friends. In this Christian walk, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up. Amen? Everybody's going to mess up. And so the thing about it is, because I've done, even though I have blank, nevertheless, God forgives me. And I want you to do this homework. Take that home with you. Fill that out. And copy that phrase as many times as you think you need to. And I want you to remember this. As far as the east is from the west, is as far as He takes it away from us. Nevertheless, God forgives me. You know, that's an answer to the prayer in Psalm 102, Psalm 32, verse 3 and verse 4, Psalm 38 in verses 3 through 5, in James 5, 15. It's, a, it's the psychosomatic effects of unconfessed sin. Or not accepted forgiveness. Friends, what is the answer? Forgiveness which begins with conf uh, confession. Not only that, you must accept the forgiveness and don't try to do penance for it. See, one of the things that we do is we have a hard time believing that God would forgive somebody like us. When we really truly look at all of the things that we've done, and there may be some people in this room today that says, Brother Don, I am struggling with this. Well, here's the deal. Are you ready? God forgives, but you have to accept that forgiveness. You will have consequences for your sin, my friends. But we don't have to do ten good things to overtake one bad thing. The thing is, is when you repent and you ask Him to forgive you, He forgets it. And then you move on in the direction of God. Now there's one more thing you're going to do with those pieces of paper. You're going to carefully burn them. You're going to tear them up into pieces. Throw them in the fireplace, which is the safest. Burn them. Be careful because we'll light the whole state of Tennessee on fire as dry as we are. And you're going to burn them. And that's representative of the fact that God remembers our sins against us no more. Does everybody understand that? He remembers them no more against us. He on purpose forgets them. You say, God forgets on purpose. He doesn't want to bring them back because it's already been paid for. Everybody with me? Do you know Carl Menninger said this? He said if he could convince the patients in his psychiatric hospitals that their sins are forgiven, 75% could walk out the next day. 75%. That's a lot. So just the very first two in the catalog are amazing. Are you all with me? Amen? Amen. The third in the item in the category of catalog... <laughs> The third item in the catalog, he said, redemption of life from destruction. Redemption of life from destruction. In verse 4, he, it says this of Psalm 103, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. In other words, he means he redeems your life from going to waste. He redeems your life from going to waste. Friends, just think about where you'd be if not for Christ. Look at the first three we've already looked at. The remission of sin. The restoration of health. The redemption of life. And we're just getting started. Number four, royal treatment. Royal treatment. Psalm 103 verse 4 says this, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. See, now He takes us into the palace. Isn't that like our God? 
He brings us into this palace in the splendid corridors. The throne room itself, He brings us. Mm. And He's going to crown us the way He does everything else. Gloriously. Gloriously. You know, think of the morning of creation. When God commanded the seas to swarm with fish, did He say, uh, He did say, let the waters bring forth fish. Or did He say that? I don't know. No. He said, let the waters bring forth fish abundantly. Abundantly. Big difference. Now think of Moses and Miriam and the children of Israel. They, they raised the Bible's first anthem of song and on, the, on the sands of Sinai and the Egyptian army had been swept away. And how did Moses put it? Did he say, the Lord has triumphed? No. He used a superlative. He said, the Lord has triumphed gloriously. <laughs> so God is going to crown us but with what? Somebody says, well, with just with kindness and, 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 and mercy. No, 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 no. He's going to crown us with loving kindness. And what else? Yes, tender mercies. God's love is incomprehensible. It is shoreless. It is boundless, bottomless, endless. It is ever unfolding. It is infinite. We can't even measure the love that God has for us. Woo! Phew, wait, wait, I'm going to get my hanky out or something, man. Whew. Whew. Harold Rimmer told of this story. There was an inland tribe in the Pacific Northwest that commissioned one of their tribe to visit the ocean. And they said this, go to the ocean and bring it back to us. Simple enough. So he went to the ocean, made it to the ocean. And he was awed by the vastness of the ocean. So he took a bottle and he, he filled up his little pouch or bottle with the ocean water, ran back to the chief. He said, Chief, here's the ocean. We sure can't measure it. That's the boundless love of Jesus Christ. That's the love of God. It is so boundless, it is so abundant that we can't measure it. Friends, we don't even have the tools to measure it. As a matter of fact, uh, this guy Nansen, he was a Norwegian explorer. And he tried to measure an extremely deep part of the Arctic Ocean. Well, the first day, he used the longest measuring uh, rope or line that he could to reach the bottom. And he wrote in his logbook, the ocean is deeper than that. Well, the next day he added more line, but still could not measure the depth. And again, he said, this, and he wrote in his book, he says, well, deeper than that. After several days of adding more and more pieces, several days continuing to add more and more and more to the cord, he had to leave that part of the ocean without learning its actual depth. All he knew was it was beyond his ability to measure. And I want to tell you, the same goes for the depths of God's love for us. We can't plumb it. We can't put a line in it. We can't measure it because it's immeasurable. And I just say, Amen. Told you I'm going to have fun. Y'all hang in. Wide. Wide is the ocean. High is the heavens above. Deep. Deep is the deepest sea. It is my Savior's love. That's pretty deep. So number one, the remission of sins. Number two, the restoration of health. Number three, the redemption of life. Number four, the royal treatment. Here we go. The fifth item in the Thanksgiving catalog. Number five is a rewarding life. In other words, satisfaction with good things. Satisfaction with good things. Look at verse five. He says, Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Oh my goodness. Friends, list the great things you have. You know, God gave us those things for our pleasure, to enjoy them. Amen? By the way, if you're married, He didn't give you your husband and your wife to make you miserable. Although that may seem that way sometimes, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I have my business card. I do marriage counseling. <laughs> Yeah, it starts tomorrow. Yeah, starting tomorrow. Wow. 
He gives us all of those good things. Friends, our attitude about those things will determine our satisfaction. Throughout history, there's been a lot written about happiness and contentment. You know, 2,000 years ago, somebody wrote, half the world is unhappy because it can't have the things that are making the other half unhappy. Hey, I put this, I put this message together before the election, folks, okay? I see your look. I see the look in your face. But really, that's true. That's truly true in our country anyway. But friends, the most unhappy person in the world is not somebody who didn't get what he or she wanted. The most unhappy person in the world is who got what they wanted then found out that it wasn't as wonderful as expected. Friends, the secret of a happy life is not to get what you want, but to live with what you've got. Friends, most of us spend our lives concentrating on things we don't have instead of thanking God for the things we do have. And then we wake up and our life is over and we've missed the beauty of the present. Friends, we'll miss it. The end of our lives, what will we miss? Friends, our problem is that we're looking at the Christmas catalog and we focus on what we want rather than rejoicing in what we have. There was a certain airline pilot. He had a peculiar habit. When he took off from his hometown of Minneapolis, he would ask the po the po pilot, po pilot, the co pilot. He said, "Told you I'm going to have fun. Don't laugh at me all you want. That's okay. I'm just going to have fun." He would tell the co-pilot, he said, the fellow sitting next to him to take the controls of the airplane. And then he would stare intently out the window for a few minutes. Well, finally the co-pilot said, you know, I've been flying with you for a while. And what are you doing? Right? I mean, the dude gives you controls and you're kind of peeking out, looking at that real, you know, right? And here's what the pilot said. You ready? He says, you see that boy fishing on the riverbank? Of course, 30,000 feet in the air, I guess, but I guess he knew he found him. The pilot says, you know, I used to fish like that. I was in that same spot when I was a kid. As a matter of fact, whenever a plane would fly over, I would just, I would watch until it disappeared and I'd say, man, I wish I could pilot that plane. And he sighed real big and he says, now I wish I could be back down there fishing. So we have remission of sin, the restoration of health, the redemption of life, a royal treatment, rewarding life. Here's number six. You ready? Rejuvenation of youth. You say, Brother Don, have you found the fountain of youth? Not for our bodies, but for our souls. Amen? You know, Psalm 105 says, Who satisfieth thy mouth with good, good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Do you realize an eagle remains strong throughout its long life? It goes through the molting process and comes out renewed and strengthened. An eagle stays strong throughout its entire life. You know, I started to think about that. I was kind of wondering. I said, you know, there's so many happy people that are Christians, it's crazy. But I wondered, do you know that the devil has no happy old people? Think about it. The devil has no happy old people. Somebody that's not saved and they're old, man, they're, they're, they're old, they're like, like 90 or something. I think I missed every person's age in here. Thank you. Everybody has a definition of old. I'm not about to give you one. The thing about it is, listen, listen. Have you ever seen folks that are just so miserable? They're lost. They're not happy. They're just like, they're, they're bitter. Satan doesn't have any happy old people. <laughs> but God sure does. Amen? Hey, listen, I don't mean to embarrass him. I want to tell you something. If you can hang around Bill Bates for any like five minutes. For those that are visiting with us, he's sitting right back there. Yeah, there he is. Wave your hand. There he is. That's it. Bill Bates, man, I tell you what. You hang around Bill Bates for about five minutes, man, and, and you'll have a smile on your face. Amen. That's just Bill. He's probably one of the most young and hard people I know. As a matter of fact, this church is so full of young and hard people, it's, it's amazing to me. 
And I'm here to tell you, God doesn't have, doesn't have, well, here there may be some sad old people, but I want to tell you, the older folks we have here, there's a lot of happy folks here. Amen? It really is. And my wife. <laughs> She's not really old. She's just sort of old. There's a kid that came up to somebody the other day and said, Man, I heard you, I heard, you know, talking about, they were talking about at the pastor's conference. They said, they said, the pastor was asking, well, I'm sorry to hear about that. Is she very old? No, she's, well, yeah, she's pretty old. She's about 40. <laughs> yeah. So if you've hit 80, you're twice as old. That's what it is, right? According to that kid. My wife, my wife, my wife has, has just such a youthful persona about her. She can talk to senior adults, middle adults, but she's really at home with the kids. Especially if they have toys. That's my wife. Huh? Nice safe, yeah. No. But it's true. You have the choice of whether to grow old in your soul. But I'm telling you, God says He'll rejuvenate your youth. You know, sometimes we sing choruses which can be sung as, as, as kind of a round, you know. And this psalm can be read like that. It locks us into an inning circle of praise. And when we get to the end, it becomes brand new at the beginning. And then we get to the end again, it becomes a new beginning. And such will our praise in an endless eternity be. You see, we'll have nothing to encumber us there. Friends, we have a tendency to forget the good things and remember the bad. And the psalmist tells us, of course, bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all His benefits. Take that paper this week. Shine those things. Put those sins down that, that you have thought that God will never forgive. Nevertheless, my God forgives. Nevertheless, my God forgives. You say, Brother Don, where does that put us? Well, here we are at the end of this message. And so, so let me give you an idea of what, the, of what I, I'm, I'm calling for in the invitation. There's two or three things. Number one. There may be some folks in this room and say, Brother Don, I cannot pray to God. I, he hasn't forgiven my sins. Because, Brother Don, I have not accepted Him as my Savior. Brother Don, I have not gone to Him. I have not realized where I was. In other words, you're in agreement with God about your sin and where you are in life. And you say, God, I'm right there. But you've never taken that next step. You have never taken the step. Yeah, you know what's good for you, but you've not brought it here yet. Maybe this is the time you need to bring it to your heart. You know, I always help folks pray, and I, I, I pray just a simple prayer to kind of help folks. And, you know, dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm lost. I need to be saved. I want to be saved. If you'll save me right now, I'll give you my life. Forgive me of my sin. Brother Don, do I have to pray that exact prayer? No, just call out to him. Jesus, save me, and he will. He will. Why in the world of that list that I have just mentioned would you ever want to live another day without Christ? Why would you want to go another day? Not sure. Why? So brother, I always have you. Well, I'm saved. Well, here's the thing. You need to start listening. You know, uh, count your blessings, name them one by one. Uh, it's ton by ton is how we need to say them. Amen? Amen. Count them. Start your day counting your blessings. Well, thank you, Lord, I put my feet on the floor. Woo, the floor is cold. Thank you, Lord, I have feeling in my feet. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> There's some people who don't have feeling in their feet. There's some people who don't have feeling in their hearts. <laughs> Lord, thank you for not letting me suffocate my husband or my wife last night, right? <laughs> Snoring us so loud, you, you're so tempted. But for the but for but in seriousness, the things of God. God, you've blessed me with another day of life. God, you've you have blessed me that I'm able to get out of this bit 
Lord, thank you for letting me reach into my cabinet and actually have food. Lord, thank you for letting me check in on my children. You know, the ones I wanted to smack into the universe last night, but you know, I love them. Right? Thank God for what we have. And when we thank God for what we have, you'll be content. Amen? So maybe you need to come to the altar and just give God thanks. There may be some folks in this room say, Brother Don, this is the church we, we feel led to be at. Well, then you come and meet me right here when the music starts. And the, and you come and meet me and say, this is where we need to be. You need to be here. God may have touched your heart about something. You're struggling with something. There's folks that are struggling with things today. Brother Don, how do you know? A little birdie told me. It's called the Holy Spirit. You can't get a room of this many people and not have folks that are struggling. And if that's you, you come, we'll pray. Whatever God has done, would you do that business with Him today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love You. We thank You. We thank You for all You've done for us. And Father, as we go into this invitation time, I pray Your will be done. Lord, help us to be thankful. Help us to list those things that we need to be thankful for. Uh, Lord, we, I pray you'll help us to claim this message. And Father, if there is a sin that we're having difficulty in accepting forgiveness,